fourth testimony is from Carmen Short. And Carmen and her husband, Patrick, have called Intercessor home for several years now, and first being introduced to our community through Grief Share's ministry. She's a joyful spirit, full of light, and a strong desire to minister to those around her. The Lord's now using her mightily to lead and grief share team to help facilitate the healing so desperately needed to those experiencing loss in their lives. Would you please welcome with me Carmen Short. Father, I thank you for my sister Carmen. Lord, I pray that as she shares her heart of who you are, that word, that power of who you are, that testimony, that it would be, Lord, a blessing for all of those who hear it. But, Lord, it would also bring healing and joy. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, I need extra prayer today. <laughs> Please join me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. May you have pity on us and bless us. May the sacrifice that Jesus made fill us with gratitude and peace. We pray that, Lord, you fill this place with your love and guide us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Good afternoon. I remember when I was a child, my Nana would pray and she'd lift her hands and I would emulate her. Not knowing why I was lifting, I did the same thing. So one day I asked her, I said, Nana, why do you raise your hands when you pray? She said, it is how I show my Lord that I am here for him. Open to listen. We lift our hands to praise and adore him. Recently, I was listening to the message on Sirius Radio, and the host, Ashley Till, said she was given a different perspective from a listener who said to her, when you see a child who wants to be held, they lift their hands up in the air. Mom picks them up, dad, nanny, nana, whoever. She says that is how she wants to feel, that she's being held and comforted by her Heavenly Father, that she is protected and being comforted. Right now, I feel like I need to be held up. <laughs> Wait. I'm telling you. All right? Okay, I'm, again, I am Carmen Short. I was raised in southeast Arizona, a small town called Thatcher, uh, by a Catholic dad and a Lutheran mom. And we would attend both churches. Then at the age of seven, we got new neighbors across the street, and they invited us to Sunday school at a Pentecostal church, which was totally different, but it was so much fun. <laughs> Sister, Sister Davis had a Tootsie Roll tree, and there were Tootsie Roll pops on it, so you would get to pick a lollipop, and if the end of the stick had a red tip, you got to pick out a toy from the treasure chest. It was like Christmas every Sunday, <laughs> I'm telling you. I remember being a missionette and going to vacation Bible school. It was such sweet and fun memories. I accepted Christ as my savior at 12 and was baptized at 13. Wow. <laughs> About me, in my spare time I live to garden. I cook, I bake, I craft, I love tea and shopping is one of my favorites. If it was a pro sport, I'd be an elite athlete. I like going to the movies. I love loving on my friends, and most importantly, I love Jesus. Amen. It was in the fall semester that I met my husband, Pat, in a first aid class. We went out on our first date eight months later. He went home to New York for the summer, and in the fall went to Lamar University on a baseball scholarship, and I went to ASU. We had a long distance relationship for two years in which we were together for 57 of those days in the same place. We will celebrate our 42nd wedding anniversary in June. <laughs> I am in love with the man who knows my heart and he still makes me laugh. He puts up with my craziness and occasional moodiness, but it's his fault, it's not my fault, <laughs> never mind. And he loves Jesus, too, so I think I'll keep him. And besides, he's been very well trained. <laughs> we left Arizona with our almost one-month-old son, Joseph, and moved to Texas for Pat to finish school after a five-year stint in Beaumont. And then in Houston, we came to New York. Pat was a health and phys ed teacher. 
He then became a Northeast supervisor for Major League Baseball for 24 years and finished another two years as a professional scout for the Atlanta Braves. He is currently a pitching coach at SUNY Old Westbury and in the summer he coaches the Long, Old, Long Island Nor'easters, a collegiate team. I've been at Hofstra University for 28 years, having worked in facilities, athletics, development, financial aid, and now I'm currently in the Saltzman Community Services Center. That's where our students who are training to be therapists, language pathologists, audiologists, and literacy specialists train. The services are provided to people in the community. Although I had a relationship with God, sometimes it was one of fear and embarrassment and never feeling good enough or worthy of him, but I still believed and went to church, prayed daily, and read my Bible. But in college, my relationship with Jesus was lukewarm at best. I tried to be a good person, but I was not as good as I could have been. I was living for the approval of my peers and not living for the approval of God. Big mistake. I regret it now. Eventually, my relationship with God started to dwindle. I stopped attending church altogether, and I was living life my way. I would pray, but I was just saying the words to be done with it. Eventually, God became an afterthought and my go-to, only when life was in crisis mode. I'm embarrassed to say I was living a godless life, a part-time Christian. But you know what's even sadder? That it didn't bother me. Looking back, I can't believe I felt that way. Ultimately, it took the death of our only child, Joseph, to be reminded of the goodness and faithfulness of God. He was 37 when he died. Joe was a happy child. When he was eight years old, he was diagnosed with Tourette syndrome, ADD, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And as he got older, he eventually got depression. He was a loyal friend. He was smart and funny. He would defend those that needed help. He was an all-around good guy, and he gave the best hugs, which I try to emulate. Ask any of our grief share people. He was a chef by profession, and in college, he played D1 baseball as a pitcher like his dad. He was an animal rescuer. He had a dog. Well, he had two dogs, Jason and Stella, and had a chinchilla named Maya. When he passed, Joe taught me that Cooking was important, that you cook with love, and that it could be tasted, and I truly believe that. He loved to travel. He enjoyed art, listening to music. He had a wicked sense of humor. That was very contagious. But he especially loved feeding people. It gave him so much joy. And on, but on the, I guess he had darkness too. With the depression, he suffered and dealt with alcohol addiction, and he one evening came home and was really upset and depressed. And, you know, we had spoken about it. And the next morning he had to go to the car because he couldn't find his wallet. He realized that the passenger side mirror of his car was missing, but he didn't remember how that happened. He was convinced that he hit another car or even worse, may have hit a person, but he didn't know. It was then that he decided to go to AA and he got sober and maintained that for five years. And within that time, he married a young lady in 2014 named Laura after dating a few years. It was from a chance meeting at get, you know, from getting off the train, the LIRR. He overcame his challenges by succeeding at whatever he attempted to do. He didn't allow his conditions to hold him back. But I'm embarrassed to say that as a mom, Joey was spiritually neglected. We would pray as a family. However, Christ was not the center of our lives. One of us would wait for him to come home when he was out at night or coming home from work. He had those crazy chef hours. One night I was watching, maybe it was 700 Club, a preacher on TV, and Joe came in, and then he questioned faith in general. And we spoke, and I explained to him that it's believing with your heart that something will be, and that knowing that Jesus is always there for us and that you can come to him with any of your problems. That night, he accepted Christ as his personal savior. And that's the one thing that I, one of the many things I'm proud to say that we shared together. On June 23rd, 2019, Joe had gotten home from a wedding in Las Vegas, and he was sick. It was a Sunday, and he was sick most of the day, throwing up. And he called us late that night, and he just didn't sound good. So his dad said, we need to get him into the ER, um, you know, so call an ambulance. So. 
we get him there and they were doing all sorts of tests and he was there for hours and scans. And then I overheard the doctor saying that he needed to be admitted into the ICU. Now we're thinking it was a hangover or food poisoning, but he had had acute pancreatitis. He was in the ICU for 59 days. I was constantly praying 24 seven for healing. He finally turned the corner and he was getting out of the ICU. Thank you, Jesus. We were told that on a Tuesday. By Thursday, he was dead. He had gotten an infection and it was fatal. I was broken, obviously. My heart was shattered and I was so angry at God. It was then in my anger that I realized how self-centered I was. I did not get the answer to my prayers that I was expecting, yet I had the audacity to be mad. Who was I? Why did I deserve an answer is what I was thinking. Where had I been? I had not had a real relationship with Jesus in a while. I reminded myself also that Joe was not mine to begin with, but I knew regardless of my being missing in action that Jesus was always there for me. But it was just I wasn't seeking him. In my brokenness, I cried out to Jesus to forgive me because I was sorry for drifting away from him and that I wanted him in my life always. I needed him to carry me through the pain, misery, and hopelessness that I felt. I had no desire to live. Going on without Joe felt senseless, but that thought scared me. I recommitted my life to Jesus. I started praying and what felt like every day, all day, I just needed him to carry me. I dusted off my Bible and began reading the Psalms. Two weeks after Joe's death, I started Grief Share here at Intercessor in September 2019 to work on my grief. Pat was working that day and he joined me a week later. Every Sunday, we were so lovingly welcomed by Melanie, Debbie, Jeannie, and Carol, and we looked so forward to those meetings. They were our lifeline, as well as the other members that were participating and suffering with their grief as well. Then a month later, I walked through the doors of the Church of the Intercessor and again was welcomed by Melanie and we, wel and we worshiped together. I remember excitedly telling Pat this could be our church home. Pat also started, started coming to church too. Then when COVID hit in 2020, we would stream services and watch at home. It was our lifeline. We loved the convenience of watching from home except for missing the Eucharist and just being able to watch in your jammies Flopped on the couch was priceless. We came back to in-person services and never looked back. Being here at Intercessor and Fellowship with you has brought me closer to God. Pat and I went through three series of grief share. The first time I was numb, I went through the motions. The second time I listened and the third time I learned, I was healing. When we finished, Melanie asked me to think about becoming a part of grief share in the future. I stuck it at the back of my mind. Last spring when Bishop Brett did the series on joining community groups, I knew it was time for me to step up, to give of my time to help others in grief share. I'm in my second series, still training as a facilitator in my mind, but I'm honored that grieving people are coming to us to help us with their pain. The Lord is directing us on how to help these people heal. I also do acts of kindness to glorify him and help those in need. I share my love of Jesus and what he has done for me when I have the opportunity. I try to be an example of a child of God, but I don't always succeed, but I do try. The Lord has blessed me with people in my life who love and support me and my family. Some of these dear friends, well, all of my dear friends, I consider family who were with me while Joe was sick when he died and they're still with me, loving on me and just being there. And some of them are here today. Eileen Mayer and her son, Chris, Mary Delzato, Mary Fair and Ramona Hudson. Then on our first grief share training session, I met Derek Bunyan. The day before I was to facilitate, I called Dee and asked him for advice and asked him to pray for me. He's always so optimistic and willing to help. We have a lot in common and he goes to the movies with me that Pat won't come to see. <laughs> and he's a dear friend and I consider him a brother in Christ. My dear friends, please know that you have blessed me and I thank you for your continued love and your support. 
Nothing is impossible with God, as Luke 137 says. This relationship with Jesus is so different now. I know he is always with me, that he gives me peace and comfort. I know that I do not need to fear him, but that I can come to him for everything. I only need to love him. The Lord has blessed me. He has put the pieces of my shattered heart back together. I try to live my life in a way that brings him glory. And I no longer take life for granted and appreciate all that he has given to me. All of this is possible because of God. My heart has changed by the story of Jesus. It has humbled me and shown me that I have more work to do. I am a work in progress. But I know he is always there for me. He loves me as I am and that I am good enough because I am his. I aspire to live my life and to give Jesus the praise and glory because he carries me. I want to have a heart like Jesus. What does the cross of Christ mean to me? Because Jesus died on the cross, it means to me that I will not die but have eternal life because he took my place and saved me. He willingly made the ultimate sacrifice for us. The cross means that Jesus died and resurrected. The cross and Jesus cannot be separated as they are one. I am grateful that Jesus died for you and me and has saved us. In closing, I wish to say thank you to Selena for giving me, giving my name for this honor to be able to share my testimony with you. Thank you, Father Nick, Father Jim, Deacon Ed, Bishop Brett, for your love and leadership. We as a church family are so blessed by your leadership. And thank you, church family, for your outpouring of friendship and for sharing in our love for our Heavenly Father. May we, may we remember what this day is about, and may the grace of God shine upon you on this solemn Good Friday. God bless you all. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This is one of those moments where I think to myself, I love this church, man. You know what I'm saying?